Welcome back to another episode of Fast Casual Nation. As you guys know, this show really drills down into the business of Fast Casual. We explore things that you can only imagine getting a chance to see, and today is no different. We're gonna actually jump into the Better Burger space. My name is Paul Barron, and of course, I'll be your host today. And with me, joining me, is the CEO of BurgerFi, and this is Mr. Julio Ramirez. Nice to have you on the show. Thank you, Paul. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, okay, so Julio, let's jump into BurgerFi, one of my favorite burger chains, obviously homegrown right here in South Florida. Absolutely. Got a chance to go to your original store opening yeah. over on uh, in Fort Lauderdale, and it right. was uh, quite an amazing uh, exploration as we started to see the BurgerFi brand grow. Tell me where you guys are today. What's uh, what's kind of the current status for you? Well, I, I, first of all, it's fantastic that you went to the first opening at Lauderdale by the Sea. Uh, yep. And I'm proud to say that, uh, you know, 10 years later, we're actually celebrating our 10th anniversary on February 5th. And, there you uh, go. And I think one of the great things, especially if you're a Floridian, you'd be happy to know that we're well north of 52 locations in the, in the great state of Florida. We're the premier Better Burger chain. We're the market leader in the state of Florida in the Better Burger space. Uh, a lot more than Shake Shack, a competitor that we have. We have other competitors, but we're the biggest. And uh, we're very proud of the great quality Angus grass-fed grain finished pro products that we have with no antibiotics, no chemicals, no steroids, etc. A great, great tasting burger. And I grew up loving uh, hamburgers. I was a formerly a, a fast food junkie, as they used to say. Yep. And the reality <laughs> is now that I'm now that I'm a little bit older, I enjoy eating a healthier burger with the great qualities of our products. And so I'm very, very uh, fortunate to be at the helm of this great company based yeah. in Florida. So definitely your background with Burger King International, a lot of uh, QSR experience yeah. in, you know, in kind of moving to the fast casual category, uh, there's a handful of QSR executives that have been able to do this very eloquently. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'll go over to Brian Nickel, uh, which is obviously the CEO at Chipotle, mm -hmm. coming over from uh, Yum and their team. Um, right. The transition going over from QSR to a fast casual that really resonates with consumers in a different way, was there anything that you were kind of uh, looking at uh, as saying, wow, I'm really excited about this particular challenge? Yeah, let me share. Let me share a good story with you. I had, in my 35 years in the industry, 26 of those years was at Burger King Corporation. So you know, early in my career, from literally from 1984 to 2010, had a variety of assignments in uh, at Burger King Corporation, uh, and had a leadership role both in domestic and international roles. But I did probably three or four key roles, but I was never the CEO. So when I left Burger King in 2010, I told myself. Boy, wouldn't it be great if I finally had the shot to run a, a smaller chain that the best years are ahead of it um, yeah. at a veteran age and be able to build a team and work with a team that uh, that could do that. And, and lo and behold, right in my backyard, here's BurgerFi, right? So yeah. between 2010 and, and literally in the last 100 days, I actually was co-owner of a fast casual chain. So I actually went from Burger King Corporation senior executive to owning and being a co-franchisor of Giardino Gourmet Salads, which was a fast casual salad concept based yep. in Coral Gables, Florida, and yep. uh, was very involved in, in working with that brand and turning it around. And so I, I used to explain to people, I went from having four, pe four people pick me up in Sao Paulo, Brazil to tour restaurants <laughs> or Buenos Aires, Argentina or Moscow to driving up in, up in Davie, Florida and Boca Raton. <laughs> And so that change go. of, of going to fast casual for me was great because, frankly, it tuned me to to the to the fast casual business, which has grown so much in the last 10 years. And so I was the one dealing with loyalty apps and, and negotiating franchise agreements and talking to landlords directly myself. And so in a much smaller footprint. And, and now after having done that now at BurgerFi, it's a bigger chain than the than the fast casual chain I was with but not as big as Burger King. So I'm in the sweet spot right sure. now. I can take the experience I had of the many years in QSR and the right. experience of having a startup. And here I am right in the sweet spot of a chain that has its best years ahead of it that's in growth mode, which is really kind of what I did at, at Burger King, grew the brand tremendously in Latin America and in parts of the U.S. So very excited to be yeah. here. I love to see brands like BurgerFi kind of stepping in and looking for 
uh, you know, seasoned executives that are able to kind of understand the market pressures and sure. kind of the big challenges of a growing chain. Right. You know, and I think, you know, I think uh, I'll just get back to Chipotle again. I think their strategy of moving Steve out and, and putting in Brian, that was really kind of what put that uh, that brand sure. on track. They're just, you know, super performing now, of course, obviously one of the high performers in uh, during uh, COVID. Yeah. So Julio, when we get into kind of where uh, BurgerFi strategy is going. Obviously, yeah. the SPAC, uh, the special acquisition company or mm -hmm. corporation, uh, your merger with them and putting BurgerFi on uh, the New York Stock Exchange. This was a big move. Obviously, this is putting you guys in the right position to compete against someone like a Shake Shack. What are some of the things you guys are looking to do as a new publicly traded company? Yeah, it's a great question. And just to clarify, we actually opened uh, December 17th, I believe, on the NASDAQ, not in the New York Stock Exchange. So let's get okay, right. got to get the right yeah. trading floor. NASDAQ. But, uh, <laughs> but it, listen, it happens a lot. Uh, but what I wanted to let you know is what it's done for us, it's really uh, given us permission and investment, if you will, of being a public company. A lot more capital can be put forward to, to take the brand to the next level. You know, one of the beautiful things about joining this brand is the great people and the great culture that exists here. I was very impressed with the values and the beliefs of the team here at hand. I think that the the training team, the operations team that's here, the culture that was here, not much to my surprise. I think that's one of the reasons I came over here. It was fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I think that I, I would tell you it's world class. And so it's just great to, to work with a bunch of folks that frankly did some amazing things. I mean, think about what Burger Five before we went public. Think about uh, the great quality products that already have. We're the only better burger chain that has not only the great tasting a rated uh, hamburgers that have no antibiotics, et cetera, but we're the only one that has a plant-based beyond burger. We make our own quinoa veggie fi, a great product. So our whole lineup right. of burgers is really the broadest in the industry. In my opinion, we have the best onion ring, not just in fast casual. We have the best onion ring, I think in the industry, they're about they're bracelet sized, uh, double battered, amazing product is made fresh to order. Our fries are, freshly made cut in store and our in our desserts are, are world class ice cream store quality and so the opportunity came how do we take that and then accelerate the growth and i think the vehicle of going public has given us the capital to be able for example i'll just give you a couple of examples to build company restaurants what we call cluster cities right. so instead mm -hmm. of just having uh, company restaurants in broward county and palm beach county we're going to have the ability to open company restaurants in atlanta georgia nashville tennessee Richmond, Virginia. And all of a sudden that becomes a great franchising flag because we already have a few stores in Atlanta, but now right. by having the company restaurants there, we can do training in the market. We can help create a co-op to create more advertising and marketing dollars. And frankly, it shows our franchisees that we believe in the brand and we have skin in the game. And I think our, our focus is really to kind of grow up the Eastern seaboard. You know, we, we have a very, uh, if you're a Floridian, you know, the type of growth, for example, that Publix, uh, has done in the market in SunTrust, where you kind of oh, started yeah. in Florida and work your way up. I think probably very similar to that. Now we do operate in other states, so we'll be we'll be doing obviously opportunistic deals to support franchises that have opened in other places. But our sweet spot is going to be to take the Southeast, where we're the dominant player in Florida and we're the leader in four or five other states in the Southeast, and continue to do that and work our way up and, and then meet up with our restaurants in Maryland and New York, which where we already operate. So it's a very exciting opportunity. We have a smaller footprint, so it's easier for us to go into markets. I think that's one of the reasons we have 52 plus restaurants in Florida and Shake Shack has 17. They're looking for much bigger locations. We're looking for smaller locations and different varieties. Um, one, one interesting thing I want to share with you is we're going to actually be doing in this in the spirit uh, in the spirit of being a fast casual that has to move quickly with the times, we're actually looking to do in Miami-Dade County some additional restaurants with a smaller footprint, literally almost half the size of our building, which are not okay. the typical footprint we have. We're, we're going to learn a lot from that. So we're very excited about that opportunity as well. Yeah. I love the fact that you guys are exploring and experimenting with, uh, you know, some new new prototype formats, which yep. is in right now is all the rage in, in fast casual. And we Absolutely. could see some pretty, pretty aggressive growth uh, with several brands and maybe including uh, BurgerFi here, especially as you guys look to expand on that. When sure. when you looked at developing those, um, was this something obviously driven by 
the consumer demand kind of moving off-prem? What was kind of the, I'm assuming that's the, yeah. the, the driver well, for this? You know, the beautiful thing is even before I got here, we were, there were a lot of discussions by management to begin to do some of this stuff. And I think, as I call it, the great infection, you know, with the pandemic starting, I think it just really focused us on what's the best way that we can get our product to our consumer, no matter how they want it. And so, for example, we were the first better burger chain to open a drive through We opened a beautiful drive through in a suburb of Lexington, Kentucky. And we do, we do what are called second generation buildings. So we look for second generation buildings. So because of COVID, unfortunately, some players didn't make it. And so there's an opportunity right. to take certain buildings that have come up. So we actually opened our first uh, uh, drive through location uh, in the suburb up in Kentucky. And it was fantastic because actually the dining room was actually shut down because of COVID. So we were able to serve our consumers because of the digital space. We were able to do both the drive through as well as online and, and delivery and all that type right. of stuff. So it was a great, uh, great opportunity. We're working on our, our second drive through will be in Las Vegas, Nevada. That'll be coming up in about a month, month and a half at the most. So we're yeah. going to learn a lot. It's exponential learning with all this stuff. Recent data coming in on your delivery sales up 121% in Q4, which is uh, year over year yeah. uh, to 2019. That's a, you know, that I've seen big numbers before yeah. in terms of delivery sales moving. Yeah. Uh, I haven't seen many brands move into the plus 100% in terms yeah. of growth. Yeah. Where do you think that's falling that's why, and why are you guys winning? Well, that's why we talked about it. And, and I'm, let me give you another statistic related to that. In March, right before the pandemic, you know, as the pandemic was starting, 28% of our business, 25 to 28% was, was online. Now we're upwards of 65%. So yeah. what that means is that our guests are looking to uh, order in a, a new way where they can just order online and not have to go into the restaurant. And it's a variety. It reflects itself in a variety of ways. People, people will order online and have takeout. We are working on curbside formats, the drive through and the other one's what we call the park through. That's basically where you go through the drive through because right. we have larger orders because of technology. We'll ask people, listen, we're, we're preparing for you some handcrafted onion rings and this great shake, custard shake. Please pull up to park in place number two and we'll have it out for you in five to seven minutes. And we're finding that we're doing just fine. And we actually for the drive through, we actually prepared, uh, prepared our first combo meal, if you will. We actually redesigned our drive through to be able to move product faster. And we've had mm -hmm. absolutely no issues. We thought perhaps some customers were used to three minute speed of service at checkers or whatever. But for the for the great handcrafted food, people will wait five to seven minutes if we do a right, great job. Right. That. So that's been good. But to answer your question, we're definitely higher year over year in big numbers in the digital space. And who knows, right? After after the great pandemic is over, I believe some some of this will remain. I don't know that life's gonna change overnight. I think we need to be we need to be prepared and adjust and always be listening to our guests. One of the things we use our loyalty app for is to really understand what issues folks have, what do they want, how do, how do they want to be served, et cetera. So if you listen to the guests on social media, uh, that's the best That's the best way to stay in touch with stuff and just move quickly. You know, we're still a relatively small chain. We've got great franchisees and a great uh, nimble company base, and we like to move quickly to respond to the market. Yeah, for sure. I can see I see that you guys are doing that, obviously, with uh, some of the moves you're making in terms of the the market itself. I yeah. want to jump back to the plant-based side because yeah. that's something that you guys do a little differently. Yeah. Um, you know, you have the VeggieFi, which is your own in-house uh, menu and recipe, and then you have the Beyond Burger. So right. uh, really kind of two different approaches to yeah. a plant-based. What's What seems to be working for you guys? Because I'm kind of curious on that. I think uh, this is going to sound like a very political answer, but the answer is all of the above. I mean, we yeah. we truly, you know, you're, you're it's a it's a great question, but you got to look at the comparison in our regular lineup of regular uh, uh, no antibiotic burgers. We have four or five right. classic burgers that we serve all the time, so we have a lot more mm -hmm. of those options. But the Beyond Burger was we were the first uh, better burger chain to enter in that space of plant based, and so the Beyond Burger actually gives somebody the opportunity to have a totally plant based product. And Beyond Burger is a great partner of ours. We're very excited to have, we're very fortunate to have them. I know there's some other players in the space. We like the one we have and we continue to work with them. The Let me tell you a little bit about our VeggieFi. I, I don't know if, if I said it at the beginning. We actually produce the VeggieFi product in our commissary here in North Palm Beach. Now mm -hmm. I used to run supply chain 
for four years, my last job at Birking, among other things, as the head global operations guy, I had supply chain worldwide. And I can tell you that our facility here in North Palm Beach, our commissary is world class. And first of all, we have the opportunity to grow even more. So we, you know, we make our Vegify with uh, 16 ingredients, 15 ingredients plus love is our 16th ingredient. It's a great product. Uh, it's, it's, uh, and it's, and people love it. I mean, it's actually, you know, there's a lot of chains that have a veggie burger. I don't think any are as famous as ours. We, we have a huge demand. I don't have the product mix in front of me, but it's a significant amount. Uh, and we distribute it through Cisco. And there's even, there's even other concepts that order our product and we sell it and we sell it in other businesses as well. So it's, uh, you know, you have a winner when there's demand to buy that product. So yeah, very excited about the future to- growth of that. Yeah, I don't have to be as political on that. I'm a, I'm a Burger Fi customer, and I, I love the Veggie Fi. I've tried the Beyond, but the Veggie Fi is kind of like in my heart. If sure. I'm going to go away from the beef for the night, then that's the one I'm going to select. That's there a great go. product. Good. Uh, pretty impressive, and it's got. Uh, and I see consumers or guests, both online and internally, when I'm in your restaurants. Is yeah. that's that seems to be a very popular product. Uh, for is. you guys. So kudos yeah. to what you're doing. Yeah. Of course, I think with in, in-house development, you can control all those yeah. those factors and really make a good product. Yeah, we have uh, Chef Paul Griffin has been with the brands literally since the beginning of the brand in 2011 with our, our yeah. founder, John Rosati. And uh, I'll tell you, he's like the, I always compare him to the weapons guy in the 007 movie, the guy that has all the secret weapons in the James Bond movie. That's our chef. I mean, the work that he has done on on uh, developing the products, not only the, the existing menu items, but our limited time offers. We do a great job on limited limited time products. We just finished right. a mac and cheese, uh, uh, double cheeseburger, burger right. fried cheeseburger. That was incredible. It was it was uh, throughout the country. We talked to all of our operators on a regular basis, and it was getting kudos not only in the South where everybody loves cheese. But all over the U.S., I mean, it was rave reviews to the point where we actually extended it a few more weeks. It was a great product. So anyway, yeah, look, for sure. look for look for both our existing items and a, a little bit of limited time offers once in a while, because I think that adds some news to the business. Yeah, for sure. Julio, I want to jump into uh, your move into some of the drive through, obviously, with your uh, yeah. units that you're starting to you know, integrate drive through. Do you think this is something that is going to kind of reformat the way fast casuals are you know building out operations for smaller footprints for takeout and delivery and then when you do need uh you know kind of that iconic store for presence in a market do you think drive through could be uh the play here yeah i think there's a lot of there's a lot of guests even though i think many do long for the day when they could go back in and one of the beautiful things about our cool eco-friendly image of our restaurant and it's a, just a beautiful place to hang out is you can go out on a date you can go with a family and have a great meal in our location, I think people long for that. But but in the middle of that, I think there are people that right now, until they get vaccinated or you know they're they're concerned about whatever's mm-hmm. going on, they'll they'll use a drive through all day long. So in our current pipeline of locations, we have about you know over 35 locations in a pipeline already of future sites, both company and franchise, and we have an assortment of drive through opportunities, which are second generation buildings that have come up. And I, right. I think it has to be in the art. Not every restaurant will have a drive through, but I just think it's got to be there. I, I, who knows what the future is going to bring. Right now, I will say yeah. this um, and specifically, Charlie, that I know has been on your show before. He, he's leading the charge in our development strategy. Him and our construction people actually spent the afternoon yesterday looking at 10 or 12 different concepts up at Palm Beach Gardens, just looking at all the different things that competitors are doing that we can learn from. Yeah. So you might mm-hmm. pick up a nuance on curbside from one chain. Uh, a drive the other day I saw it at a location that will remain nameless to protect the innocent. We saw a drive through we saw a drive through lane that had a place for mobile app users to go through the drive through and then regular customers to go through the other lane and they met up at a certain point. So that was a yeah. creative idea. So we're gonna pick the best of the ideas that are out there. We don't need to be the inventor. We just need to be the chain that adapts and picks the best thing for our guests to to really handle the total needs that exist out there. Yeah. Fast casual has been uh the one sector well, QSR to a certain extent, but fast casual definitely has been the one sector to really become somewhat bulletproof yeah. through this downturn. Most of the concepts like yours have been able to sustain growth, look at positive yeah. comp sales. Sure. There's a lot of movement in that direction. How, you know, when you look at kind of the, the bigger competitive field of it, which is going to come yeah. from QSR when we yeah. get back into kind of normal life, yeah. do you think the QSR guys can ever catch up? 
in the better. You know, that's a great space. question. That's a question that that I think keeps some of us up at night, always thinking about competition. It's a very fluid environment, as you know. Um, I think there are QSR players out there uh, that are known for quality food. I'm not going to sit here right. and name them, but they exist. However, I think the QSR consumer typically uh, is used to probably paying a lower check than in the than in the better right. burger space. So you know they might be thinking mm -hmm. they might be going and, and trying to buy have a total check be six or seven, maybe eight dollars at the most. And I think the problem is if the QSRs try to compete on a on a basis mm -hmm. with the larger players on a handcrafted basis, doing some of the things that we do, which take by the way extra labor, more expensive right. ingredients and things like that. I think they'll price themselves out of their out of their consumers. And so I think what we need to do is continue to work on reducing. And we actually have a focus with our franchise advisory council and internally a focus on reducing our operating costs as well as our building costs so that we can do the best job possible uh, and provide a great quality product, but do it as efficiently as possible. So our prices stay within line. You know, at the end of the day, the, the wallet, your wallet is what it is. You know, it only holds so many dollars and, and we're trying to get more guests coming here, not the other way around. So our focus is really on on value. You know, we want to make sure value is not, in my mind, value is not the lowest price. Value is feeling good about what you're paying for what you're getting. I think we do a great job of that. I think we exceed expectations with the quality of our menu. Uh, but you got to always keep in mind there's others out there that can come close at a lower price. So you got to be able to, you got to be able to compete and know that no one's asleep at the wheel in the competition. You have to be a little bit paranoid always. Um, and I think we have an advantage to your to answer your question totally. I think we have an advantage versus the next category up, casual dining, and that in right. our case we can provide a similar atmosphere, but without you know without you having to tip and not a significant bigger check. So I think we're in the we're in the sweet spot of high quality at, a, at an affordable price, and that's our goal. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, you know, I continue to, I, I kind of agree with you in the sense of uh, the QSR concepts are really going to have a, a big leap uh, to be yeah. able to get into the fast casual space. I've seen them try, I and mean, it's been sure. something that, you know, many brands, it, either through acquisition, you sure. know, Habit Burger obviously being purchased uh, last two years ago, uh, yeah. that attempt by Yum. There's a lot of companies that are starting to look at that play, and I think that uh, is probably the only way. But even then, yeah. integration of a QSR mindset into a fast casual yeah. reality is a very tough thing to do. Let, let me, uh, talk Paul, to, Paul, let me go just, ahead. And I, yeah. I just want to uh, give you one, just one example. In a fast food restaurant, again, that will remain nameless, if you compare onion rings, for example, all the right. onion rings in a certain chain, they're all the same size. You throw them in a fryer, and that's it. In our chain... We take a Spanish colossal onion that's about this big. We cut off the ends, dice it up, and we use that as an onion condiment that people want in their burgers. But then we slice the onion, remove the onion rings, which are this big, remove the membranes. We bread them in a special uh, recipe that we have, uh, beer batter them one time, and then we beer batter them again when it's ordered. So you get a fresh, unbelievable onion ring. It's like jewelry. And so, right, right. So, <laughs> For a fast food, for a QSR restaurant to, to do that level hand quality, it's just not in their model. I just think it's yeah. going to be very hard for them to do that. Yeah, for sure. Totally agree with you. Uh, two last topics here. One is on virtual brands and ghost kitchens. Your thought yeah. on expansion in that area. Yeah. yeah, first of all, very, very hot topic, very popular in the industry, getting a lot of news. We were, we were among the first, if not the first, Better Burger chain to actually do a ghost kitchen. We signed an agreement with Reef Kitchens. Another yep. Florida concept, by the way, I'm continuing on right. this Florida theme. They are based in Miami, Florida. Just actually met with them the other day, met on a top to top meeting. We're already we're in 11 different uh, ghost kitchens in different cities. It's a nice way to it's a, it, we, we're testing a variety of things. We're testing how does our brand perform where we're in a city where people know our brand uh, in a digital right. space. And how do people perform in a city where we don't have any brick and mortar? How does our brand perform yep. in the digital space alone, like Austin, Texas, like mm -hmm. like uh, we're looking at Seattle and some other cities that we're looking at. And so we're still learning. I mean, some of these have only been in place for a month and a half. So we need a, we need a couple months to really understand what we have. But in my opinion, it's just a great way to, to really test the brand with really minimal effort other than just training, training the folks that run it. They do a great job execution wise and people can learn to understand our brand without us even having a restaurant in the same city. That's 
pretty impressive. Yeah. So I, I think it's uh, yeah. one of the innovative things that we've done in the space and, and one of many more that we want to do. So you're bullish on it. You, you think this is something that is definitely going to, to be a potential trend here. I, well, it's early. You know, I, I don't want to proclaim a total victory yet, but we're feeling good about it. <laughs> Obviously, we'll learn as you go to different regions. It's still early to understand how we perform in, sure. in places where our brand is not physically there. But it is another vehicle getting awareness with, frankly, m little risk. And I think that's what right. I like about it. You know, and they're yeah, good partners and we're working with them. It, yeah, and it's definitely what you just mentioned. The risk is low uh, yeah. if you've got a good brand and sure. people can migrate to it quickly, especially if you have a good a, pro a good product, and you yeah. keep consistency rolling there. I think you could, you guys could be a prime, you know, a prime target for this to be an expansion across the U.S. for sure. Yeah, so it'd be absolutely. interesting to see how you guys do for sure. Yeah, absolutely. All right, la last question for you, Julio, and yeah. that is. Um, you know, when you look at fast casual, you've been in the business for a long time, the restaurant yeah. business. Yeah. And you look at 2021, kind of uncertain waters. What is the one trend or particular thing that you are really close on your list of, I got to get this done? Well, first of all, we're a public company. Uh, just to remind everybody, as a public company, you feel almost an extra sense of responsibility to be yeah. on top of your game in terms of the metrics, your targets that you have. Uh, and we, we push undaunted on the big bold goals that we have we know that we know that for example i personally have had my first vaccination shot i have my second one next week and i look to be able to travel a little bit and visit our great franchise partners not only in the u.s by the way but internationally to visit visit our partners and be with them in the field of battle if you will uh i think that no one really knows what's going to happen with the pandemic i, I think you know now you hear of different strains out there and all that. Yeah. And it's, in mm -hmm. spite of all that, I think what we've learned is that this team remains very focused. We hope to have record-breaking uh, no, number of restaurants open up. Uh, we've just hired a brand new uh, chief marketing officer that's going to help us focus on building not only trial, but awareness and repeat business and frequency of our brand. So we're excited about that. And I think we, we really tried to combine the very best of – the QSR, the many years of QSR experience that myself and others might have with, frankly, the, the newness of the youth, if you will, of the fast casual industry, the entrepreneur spirit that BurgerFi has had over the years. We want to we want to keep that nimble spirit that we have and combine, you know, a great team is one that's comprised of, of building everybody together and everybody adding value and remain focused on the goal, you know, the goal to, to be the best burger chain we can. We don't I always say we don't have to be the biggest. We just have to be the best in the neighborhood, and the numbers will fall by the way. If we continue to be the best in the neighborhood, the growth will come. I'm absolutely convinced. And so the team is juiced up. We're excited, and we hope to continue to do very innovative things in the space. Yeah. Any trend you're watching for 2021? Well, I think more. I think the big trend would be, like I said earlier, the different varieties of ways we can serve our customer uh, you know, continued, you know, what's not just, not just do existing drive through buildings, but what can we add to the drive through to make it even more right. innovative, even faster? How can we make curb service be really exciting? And there's a lot of stuff out there to learn from. I mean, we, we, we're learning a lot from the competition. Um, I think this whole social media space is just, it's amazing. It's amazing how the business has changed the use of the app. If we can become the leader in, in, the, in, you, in engaging with the consumer and understanding what the consumer wants and being able to get the stuff that they want as fast as they can. Um, and when they finally do come inside again, which they will, we, we will continue to also provide great service inside. So it's really, it's really challenging to be on your game in, in all formats and in, in this omni-channel uh, version of what you have to deliver. Yeah. Well, good luck on what you guys are doing there at BurgerFi. It's always great to talk to CEOs that are leading the charge out there. Uh, thanks for stopping in on the show today, Julio. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure, Paul. Thank you. Ab absolutely. All right. So all you guys listening in over on the podcast, whether you're on iTunes or Spotify, make sure and leave a comment and, and or a rating. That's how we kind of learn from you as to what you want to hear and listen to and view here on Fast Casual Nation. Uh, if you are on YouTube, make sure and subscribe to us. Hit the bell. It'll give you notifications of when we have more content just like this right here from Foodable Network. And if you have an idea of someone you think should be on the show, uh, just shoot an email to us to producer at foodabletv.com or you can hit me on, on Twitter, which is just at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on Fast Casual Nation.